Bonjour! Siaw? Hola! Ano nga sa'yo? Maayong aga! Naimbag abigat? Maayong buntag! Or shall I say, a wonderful morning to each and every one? I am Montessa Marie S. Dalieda, and together with Ruiz Marcabildo Jr. C., Kabusog Jerry Kidoy C., Palomar Marjun, Ubina Marilo G., Palomar Puremi C., Palomar Rosli A., we will discuss to you what are the domestic problems and policies. So set back and relax and let us all listen and learn new set of ideas about the world and the people around us. Now what is domestic problems all about? Domestic problems means the internal affairs or issues of a nation. For example, on our country. Inflation, food and energy crisis, and the potential for conflict are the three critical risks facing the Philippines under the new leadership of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. The Philippines, a country of more than 70 million people, and with a relatively high population growth rate, faces significant problems of poverty, unemployment, and underemployment, and particularly of environmental degradation. On this video, we will discuss to you some of the domestic problems and policies, such as poverty, growth and income distribution, population growth, unemployment, rural and urban migration, educational development, agricultural transformation, and rural development, and lastly, environment and development. Hi, this is Ross Marcy Cabello Jr., a Bachelor of Secondary Education, major in Social Studies. Now, I'm going to discuss right now about poverty and um, growth and income distribution. So first, we're going to define what is poverty. So poverty may also define as a um, not enough or not having enough money to support its basic needs like food, shelter, and clothing, and etc. It may also define as a when those basic needs that I have mentioned a while ago is not being fulfilled. So, and this poverty can also lead the social problems that we are currently facing right now. Unemployment, um, malnutrition, and many more. So yeah, poverty is one of the social problems that our society is uh, currently facing right now and it's really rampant in our country. So now, what would be the pa uh, there's a possible question that comes up in our mind. What would be the possible causes why poverty exists in our society? So there, there, I'm going to discuss right now the possible causes. So the first one, that would be little or no access to livelihoods or jobs. So in our society, not all of us are being given opportunities to have a decent job and a decent income to support our basic needs. Now, if ever we don't have any decent income or jobs, then that would also lead into poverty. So the next thing, that would be um, conflict. It might be society, it might be in the society or in the political conflict or in your personal conflicts. So it may also lead into poverty. Why? Because not all of the people in that specific community or society will cooperate. Um, so it may also lead into poverty. So uh, in regards to the political conflict, not all of the programs, budgets will come out to support the um, the needs of the uh, of the society. So it may also lead to poverty. The second one uh, that would be inequality. So since that there are some conflicts, there are some misunderstandings. Since that we as a human as we are, we have different perspectives. Now poor, rich, or those, shall we say, those people that has a capacity or a money. So we are being treated equally in our society. So we can sense that one, especially when we access healthcare, justice, or law. Or, um, yeah, we can also sense those um, inequality in, in, um, in our classrooms or schools. So most of the time, those people who got the money, the power, is being treated as a higher ones than those um, shall we say the people who are being uh, considered as part of this term poverty so inequality may also lead into poverty because yeah because not all of us will be given as equal chance or um, equal opportunities in our society now, now the next thing is that would be poor education 
Okay, so according to studies, uh, most of the people that is being included in this term poverty or uh, poor um, lack educational attainment. That is because right now we really need money in order for us to finish our studies. Now, educational attainment is really important also in order for you to have a decent job because it is one of your um, requirements. You must be a college level graduate or shall we say a you have some national certificates. Now, if ever you don't have those educational attainment or you have a poor education, so it means that you will not be having a decent job and a decent income that will support your needs. So it will also lead into poverty. So the next thing that would be climate change. So that's what we are experiencing right now. Um, typhoons, uh, storms, or shall we say a unmeasurable heat or a high of temperature. So it may affect the livelihood of the people that may also result into poverty. See for example farmers. Farming is their livelihood, their source of income. So those root crops that they are planting, that would be the their source of income that will support their needs. Now if ever there's a typhoon, there's a storm, there's a miserable heat, it will affect those products that they are producing. So it may result into poverty. So right now the next thing that we're going to discuss is now uh, next cost is lack of infrastructure. So infrastructure is really important. Those buildings that we have, markets, malls, and many more, it will offer jobs, opportunities for those people that really need an income to support their needs. And if ever that specific society lacks infrastructure, so it will not be having more opportunities and more jobs that will be able or possibly being offered to those people. So it may lead also to poverty. So the last cost that we have right here is that will be limited capacity of the government. So as as we can see in our society, um, government is our um, is the one who is leading us or ruling us in our society. So if ever our government lacks the capacity to support the programs that may also help us to grow or in order for us to have some livelihoods, just like um, or to support our needs, it may also uh, result into poverty. Like infrastructures in our society, it requires budget. So if ever our government lack the capacity to make that one happen, so the other causes will also follow. So the next thing that we're going to discuss right now is all about the effects. So what would be the possible effects that we're going to experience in our society or as an individual in our com community when poverty existed? Okay, so we're going to discuss that one right now. So, the possible effects of poverty is that would be, um, it is linked with negative conditions such as substandard house, housing, uh, homelessness, inadequate nutrition, and food insecurity, inadequate inadequate child care, lack of access to health care, unsafe neighborhoods, and unresourced schools would adversely impact our nation's children. So, in that um, specific definition or that I have mentioned a while ago, so... It has a poverty really has a negative effect it will lead into other social problems that we have right now unemployment uh, crimes yeah it is because since that we don't have a decent job decent income so we're just going to commit crimes like um stealing car napping that's the only way or selling drugs that's the one of the reasons why those crimes exist it is because of poverty now uh, the other thing that is being mentioned right there is um limited access to healthcare so since that you don't have any money so it means that you don't you don't have the fully access of the healthcare that you must have to support your health needs this uh, the other thing is the um, homelessness so when we build a house it requires money right now um, the materials that we need the land where we're going to build our houses so it really requires money now if ever you um, you are in um, if ever the poverty exists so that's why that's one of the reasons why there are beggars in the street there are some people who are living under the bridge or in the um besides in the sidewalks they are sleeping in there so that's the reason why um those people who are homeless is because of poverty now there are also um negative uh effects that just like um uh Chart. So, uh, inadequate nutrition and food insecurity. So, since that you have a poverty, so you have a limited supplies of food and it will affect your health. Now, the next thing that we're going to discuss is all about growth income distribution. 
So, uh, growth income distribu distributions in our economy, there's an e economic growth. So, it is measured as increase of people's real income, means that the ratio between people's income and the prices of what they can buy is increasing goods and services become more affordable, people become less poor. So, it means that um, those people that has a um, where economic growth is from the word growth, so it means that rising or it's a measurement. It might be rising or decreasing since the um, of the uh, original income of a specific person. So the next, uh, the factors or reasons of economic growth. So there are four main factors that would be land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So these four factors will affect the economic growth. First is land. Now we need land to build our businesses, to build our uh, infrastructures that will lead us into uh, or buildings that we need to build our businesses or to make some money. So we really need land. If ever the land is being consumed, then it will affect the economic growth. Second is capital. Um, capital, it means that the uh, main foundation or shall, the, it is the money that is being used to um, as a source of your budget for your business. So that would be the main cup that is the main money that you are using to support your business and to avoid bankruptcy. The next one is labor. Labor means worker. So if ever there are so many workers in your business and it will it will be a great help in the economy. And once those labor will stop working or transfer to another place, then that would also affect the economic growth. The next thing is entrepreneurship. So it means the businesses or those entrepreneurs. Those are the most um, great contributors in economic growth. So they are building businesses, they are helping those people to make jobs, and that would be labor. And they, those entrepreneurs are having the capital or the money that is being used to um, being a source of fun of their businesses. And the next one is those entrepreneurs make use of those available lands to help the economy grow. So why is it important in order for us to understand the economic growth? So economic growth increases the state capacity and the supply of public goods. When economies grow, states can tax that revenue and gain the capacity and resources needed to provide the public goods and services that their citizens need, like healthcare, education, social protection, and public services. Also, it is important because higher average incomes enables consumers to enjoy more goods and services. Then lower unemployment with higher output and positive economic growth, firms tend to utilize more workers and creating more employment. So economic growth is really important because uh, it is because of those uh, when our economy rises or um, having some progressions, so those um, those progress is being used in order for for us to support our other basic needs, health. So when we when our economic economic growth is decreasing, so it will affect our other needs. We cannot supply medicines that our hospitals needs. We cannot supply the materials that our educate uh, that our um, our school um, those materials, books, modules that our educational or for educational purposes. So it will affect the and uh, our education. And the other thing is, um, so when when we say that our economic growth is rising, so it will really affect our resources also. So that would, so that is why it is really important for us to understand the economic growth. Now the income distribution, it's the distribution of income, is simply a statistical measure of how many people earn or receive various amounts of income. So this is. Um, it is a study, a statistical measure in order for us to have a equal of distribution of our incomes or the money that is um, being given to us, especially for the owner and for the workers. So whenever the income distribution is balanced, so it means that you will be having a balanced economy. So that's one of the things that we can also minimize or shall we say prevent poverty. So let me um, continue the discussion right here. Okay, so right now, why is it important for us to understand the uh, income distribution? Simply, uh, it is economic theory and economic policy that have long seen 
income and its distribution as a central concern. An equal distribution of income causes economic inequality, which is a concern in almost all countries and around the world. And yes, that is true. So I have mentioned a while ago, if ever um, the income distribution is not balanced, so it will cause economic inequality and it will cause many social problems. Poverty, um, lack of resources, uh, and many more. So it will trigger all of the social problems and contribute it more or it will be more difficult to be resolved so whenever our income distribution are balanced so we have more a lot of resources our services will be effective and we can prevent those social problems that we are facing right now so um that would be all in our in my part so thank you so much for listening again this is ross marcy kabala jr what is population growth all about Population growth refers to the increase in the number of individuals in a population in a particular year. It is an increase of people in a given area due to increase in infertility and or decrease of mortality and or migration. There are a lot of causes of the population growth, such as the decline in the death rate, agricultural advancements, better medical facilities, child labor, technological advancement in fertility treatment, immigration, lack of family planning, and poor contraceptive use. However, the main factors driving population growth are the fertility rates, mortality rates or life expectancy, the initial age profile of the population, whether it is relatively old or relatively young to begin with, and lastly, the migration. So now we have the fatal effects of population growth. So what are they? So first, we have the depletion of natural resources. Second, is the degradation of environment. Third, is the conflicts and wars. Fourth, is the rise in unemployment. Fifth, is the high cost of living. Sixth, is the malnutrition, starvation, and famine. Seventh, is the water shortage. Eighth is the lower life expectancy, and the ninth is extension, and tenth is the increased intensive farming, and lastly, we have the faster climate change. All of this will only become worse if solutions are not sought out for the factors affecting our population. We can no longer prevent it, but there are ways to control it. In our country, we have the Philippine Population Management Program or PPMP as a policy to address population growth. The main goal of the Philippine Population Management Program is to help the country achieve a sustainable population level, structure distribution, and quality in order to empower Filipinos to acquire a better quality of life both within the family and the society at large. Good day everyone, I am Jerry Luisi Capuzo and my part of this report is all about unemployment. So, the term unemployment is a very common to us, especially when you talk about domestic problems. We all know that it is a very huge problem in our country nowadays, in which many people are unemployed. So, before we talk all about my part in, which, uh, in this report, which is the unemployment, let's define it first for us to further understand it. So, what is unemployment? Unemployment is a term referring to individuals who are employable and actively seeking a job but are unable to find a job. Included in this group are those people in the workforce who are working but do not have an appropriate job. So, as we all know, our country is experiencing of the so-called unemployment. So, there are a number of people who are uh, available and looking for work but who are unable to find jobs. Unemployment in impacts not only individuals but communities, uh, regions, and overall economy as well. So, why unemployment is a problem in our country, Philippines? Okay, so, unemployment is a one of the problems remaining high in our country despite relatively fast employment growth in the past decade. So, uh, employment growth was not sufficient to uh, reduce unemployment because of rapid population growth and increased labor force participation. So, one of the causes of unemployment in our country is the overpopulation, the oversupply of labor force on certain industries, 
and the inability to take on available jobs. Okay, so why is it that overpopulation is one of the cause of unemployment in our country? It is because Philippines has a high population growth rate at an average of 1.7% for the past few years, consistently higher than the uh, the worst population growth rate at an average of 1.2%. So, the high population growth rate which translates to a steady supply of good rates outstrips the rate at which jobs are created and um, leaving these good rates finding themselves unemployed. Second cause is the oversupply of labor force and inability to take on available jobs. Okay, so why is it that this is also a cause of unemployment in our country? Okay, so undergraduates are still taking up college courses that are popular but were uh, uh, previously high in demand. So uh, after graduation, these uh, graduates possess skills that are that are uh, not high in demand in the job market. So as such, uh, there is a skill mismatch. So for example, in the healthcare industry, so nurses were previously in demand abroad. So many other graduates took up nursing and soon supply matches demand. And then, uh, however, the uh, the country's education system continues to produce college graduates who have taken up nursing. So, uh, as supply increases above demand, there is an oversupply of labor. And then, uh, and as a result, these graduates are unemployed. Okay, so let's proceed to the categories of unemployment. So, while the definition of unemployment is clear, economists divide unemployment into many different categories. The two broadest categories are first, the voluntary unemployment, and the second one is the involuntary unemployment. Okay, let's, just, let's discuss first what is the voluntary unemployment. Okay, so when unemployment is voluntary, it means the person left their job willingly in search of other employment. So uh, it is a situation when, uh, when a person is unemployed not due to unavail unavailability of jobs in the economy, but because of not being able to find employment of his of his or her own choice. So sometimes people reject employment opportunities if uh, if they do not receive desired wages or if uh, they are not offered the kind of work they wish to do. So uh, wealthy investors like to invest their capital in such bus businesses with a long-term growth perspective. Okay, so why does voluntary unemployment happen? So. Voluntary unemployment is likely to occur when the equilibrium wage rate is below the wage necessary to encourage individuals to supply their labor. So, um, uh, quitting one's job is an example of voluntary unemployment. So, um, my people have uh, many different reasons of uh, uh, for quitting their jobs, including not enjoying the work, inadequate pay, or um, unsafe working conditions. And then, uh, another type of voluntary unemployment is taking a leave of absence for a... Uh, uh, health issue or a family emergency and then uh, other types of voluntary unemployment include the parental leave the retirement and sabbaticals so <clears throat> people are voluntarily unemployed uh, people who are uh, voluntarily unemployed may under certain circumstances um, still uh, collect unemployment benefits okay second is the involuntary unemployment so when it is involuntary it means that a person was fired or laid off and must now look for another job. So, involuntary unemployment occurs when a person is unemployed despite being willing to work at the prevailing wage. So, it is distinguished from voluntary unemployment where uh, a person refuses to work because of their reservation wage is higher than the prevailing wage. Okay, so what are the reasons for involuntary unemployment? The first reason for the involuntary unemployment it is, is the so-called implicit contract theory. So, theoretically, unemployed workers may be willing to accept a job for a lower wage rate than market wage than uh, than the market wage. So, however, in practice, there are difficulties in actually offering a lower wage. So. There is an implicit understanding that workers should not undermine workers in work. So it would be uh, socially embarrassing to take a job off your 
of your friend by uh, undercutting their wage rate. So, uh, uh, therefore, workers are unwilling to actually offer to take jobs for lower wages. Another reason is the trade unions. So, if trade unions successfully bargain for wages uh, above the equilibrium, then those outside the trade union are prevented from accepting a job at a lower wage rate. And lastly is the efficiency wage theory. So this theory states that uh, firms, uh, uh, firms pay workers above the market clearing wage rate because it improves the productivity of workers. So by paying a higher wage, workers are more attached to their job and work harder to avoid losing it. The efficiency wage theory uh, or the, the efficiency uh, wage theory states why wages are above the equilibrium in the first place. Okay, so what are the, the differences between voluntary and involuntary unemployment? Okay, so voluntary unemployment refers to a situation when a person is uh, unemployed because he is not willing to work at the existing wage rate. And then the other hand, involuntary unemployment refers to an unemployment in which all those people uh, who are uh, willing and able to work at the existing wage rate do not get work. A pleasant day to each and everyone. I am Marilu G. Obena and my assigned topic for today is about a rural urban migration. So first, let's define what is a rural urban migration. A rural urban migration is a movement of a people from a countryside into a city areas. A rural urban migration is both a social economic phenomenon and a spatial process involving the movement of people from rural areas into our cities. It's either a permanently or semi-permanently. At present, it occurs mainly in developing countries as they undergo rapid urbanization. So now let's uh, dig deeper about a major reason for a movement. People migrate for a several reasons, so these reasons may fall under these four areas, such as the environmental, economic, cultural, and socio-political. Within that, the reasons may also be a push or a pull factors. So first, let's dig deeper what is a push or pull factors. Now, let's have a push factor. Push factor is something that can force or encourage people to move away from an area. An example of this is the famine, flooding, lack of employment opportunities, and a civil war. These are some of the reasons or factors that forces individuals to move voluntarily. And in many cases, they're also forced to migrate into another area for the individual risk. That's something if they will stay in that particular area. And another push factor may also include a race and a discriminating cultures and a political tolerance. Now let's also have a pull factor. So pull factor is one in which encourages people to move to an area. An example of this is a better job, access to education, and health. Those are the pull factors in the destination country that attract the individual or group to live in their homes. Those factors are known as a place utility, in which it is a desirability of a place that attracts people, a better economic opportunities, more jobs, and the promise of a better life often pull people into a new locations. And now, let's move forward to the impacts of a rural to urban migration. First, we have a rural area. We have here a negative and a positive impacts. First, we have a positive impacts. We have here first, a fewer people to feed, second, more land per person, third, more resources per person, and the last one is money may be sent home by immigrants. We also have here a negative impact. First, we have a population structure upset by loss of a young people. Second, a fewer economically active men left in the rural community. Third, we have uh, families are split up. And the fourth one is the elderly remain and the death rate in the community may increase. And now let's move on to the impact of rural urban migration to an urban area. We also have here a negative and a positive impact. First, let's have a positive impact. First, we have here increased economically active elements of the community. Second, we have increase in the cultural wealth. 
And the third one is more knowledge and skills in the city community. And we have here also a negative impact, which is uh, first, a pressure on a places to live. Second, tensions between older and newer residents. Third one, pressures on a services such as education and healthcare provision. Migration remains to attract much attention from numerous people include rising concern. Rural to urban migration, especially among youth, is still an ongoing issue that has become the global concern. Rural to urban migration, especially in low-income nations, is seen as contributing to shortage in the provision of adequate housing, scarcities of basic infrastructure and services, including overcrowding and congestion as well as increasing exposure to environmental threats. Moreover, rural urban migration is considered as a silent killer in the city areas because this migration is stimulating problems such as pollution, congestion, and overpopulation which gives rise to numerous socio-economic issues. Good morning everyone! I am very May Kotat Bagmore and my assigned topic is all about the educational development. So what is educational development? Educational development is a growing environment field defined as helping colleges and universities function effectively as teaching and learning communities. And actions aims at enhancing teaching, a key lever of ensuring institutional quality and supporting institutional change. With all of these definitions having in common is the enhancement of work of colleges and universities, often with a focus on teaching and learning. The POD network prefers the term educational development instead of, um, for example, faculty development because according to past president Leandra Little, it better encompasses the breed of work we do, including levels individual, program, and institutional, and key audience, like graduate students, faculty, postdoctoral scholars, administrators, and organizations serve. Educational development is the term most inclusive term for POD network members, which encompasses a number of subfields. First, the faculty, graduate student, and postdoc development. Faculty, graduate student, and postdoctoral scholar development refers to those programs which focus on the first individual instructor or future faculty member. Specialists in this area provide consultation and teaching, including class organization, evaluation of students, in class teaching methods, active learning strategies, emerging teaching and learning technologies, and all aspects of design and presentation. They also advise instructors on in other aspects of teacher or student interactions, such as advising, tutoring, discipline, policies, and administration. An additional frequent focus of such programs is the instructor, a scholar, and professional. These programs offer assistance in career planning, professional development, and scholarly skills such as grant writing, publishing, committee work, administrative work, supervisory skills, and a wide range of other activities expected of faculty. For graduate and professional students, these programs may take the shape of preparing future faculty or preparing future professionals, designed to prepare them for future career decisions. A third area on which these programs focus is the instructor as a person. This focus includes wellness management, interpersonal skills, stress and time management, assertiveness development, and a host of other programs that address the individual's well-being. The second subfield of educational development is instructional development. Instructional development takes a different approach for the improvement of the institution, with a focus on the course, the curriculum, and student learning. In this approach, instructors become members of a design or redesign team, working with instructional design specialists to identify appropriate course, structure, and teaching strategies to achieve the goals of instruction. Instructional development programs can also examine how a course fits into the overall depart departmental and institutional curriculum. They help define instru instructional goals and methods that will maximize learning. They evaluate course effectiveness in terms of goal achievement. They support faculty in selecting and using teaching and learning technologies. And they produce or evaluate learning materials for use in the course. 
The third subfield of educational development is organizational development. Organizational development provides a perspective on maximizing institutional effectiveness. The focus in this program is the organizational structure of the institution. The philosophy is that if one can build a structure that will be efficient and effective in supporting faculty and students, the teaching or learning process will be tried. Many centers are involved in large-scale institutional change efforts involving high-level college and universities priorities, such as grants to design, transform teaching and learning structures and practices. Another area of organizational development focuses on um, developing leadership capacities in faculty and administrators. One activity such programs offer is administrative development for department chairs, deans, and other decision makers. The reason is that these are the individuals who will be making the policies that affect how courses are taught, how faculty are hired and promoted, and how students are admitted and graduated. A cross of all this emphasis, institutional change, personality, leader, and key focus of organizational development is a structural plan to improve educational practices. And that's all my part. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Leslie Ipanomar, and my topic is all about agricultural transformation and rural development. But first, let us define what is agricultural transformation. So, agricultural transformation is the process over time by which the agri-food system evolves from subsistence around oriented and farm-centered into more commercialized, productive, and off-farm-centered. Then, what is the importance of agricultural transformation? So the importance of agricultural transformation, it draws attention to the fact that agriculture sector offers possibilities for increased productivity while also adapting to and mitigating climate change, thus safeguarding also in future production. While rural development involves efforts that are economics and social in it, intended to encourage concepts of retention, growth, and expansion areas outside cities, including improving quality of life for rural residents through such activities. So, agricultural system is an assemblage of components which are united by some form of interaction and interdependence and which operate within a prescribed boundary to achieve a specified agricultural objective on behalf of the beneficiaries of the system. So, they are four useful to view agriculture in a system framework, which are inputs, outputs, and linkage. So when we see inputs, it is the labor, fertilizer, seeds, land preparation, land quality, and tenure. And agricultural inputs are any external source put into soil that can help a farmer's upcoming yield. So products permitted for use in organic farming. And also outputs is the production in form of mature crops and income earned and allocated. And also, agricultural output measures the value of agricultural products, which free of interbranch consumption is produced during accounting period and before. Processing is available for export and for consumption. So the measure of output refers to the final input. And lastly, leakage means the labor intensity, type of crop or rice, rubber, and etc. Land size, income, earn, and traditional system. Good day everyone, my name is Martin Bloomer and I will want to talk about the domestic problems and policies in environment and in development. So according to Oxford Bibliography, Environment is defined here as the entirety of the physical world, consisting of the world's land masses, oceans, and atmosphere. In other hand, development is defined as the process of growth and change in human social, political, and economic systems. <clears throat> the two terms have been traditionally intersected in developing areas where one or more natural resources have been utilized to promote economic growth. 
Developing areas are defined as those places where economic and or social development has been slower, hindered, or in some way less than average. This need not refer to country or continental units of space, nor need it to be restrict, restricted to be the global south or third world. Those terms often connote a homogeneity that research has shown to be problematic. So, what is the role, what is the role of environment in development? So, its role is uh, a healthy environment supplies the necessities of life like water, food, and air. It also provides resources for economic growth and the means to fight natural hazards. So, the relation between the development and environment. Development has, uh, has become one of the means that has contributed to the depletion and even pollution of the resources of the environment. Such development can be described as a development that benefits the economy more than the environment or man. In doing or making development needs resources because development cannot be done without these natural resources. And the development affects the environment as um, as urban development has been linked to many envi environmental problems such as pollution. And those pollutions were air, soil, and water pollution. And also the loss of wildlife have that. Because just just like I said earlier, developing needs natural sources to make progress for development. <laughs> Uh, urban development and the environment. So in environmental problems of urban slums such as health threatening pollutants, unsanitary environmental conditions, serious impact on poor industrialization and urban air pollution, pollution tax, absorptive of capacity of the environment, severity of industrial pollution, impact on health, problems of congestion such as clean clean water and sanitation, high health and economic costs associated, drug on development, impact on poor, private growth have led to land subsidence and flooding, impact on export earnings. Next one is the local and global costs of rainforest destruction. Uh, rainforest loss contributes to global warming. So we all know that the biggest rainforest here in, here on earth is the Borneo rainforest, right? Or the Amazon rainforest. Uh, rainforest loss contributes to global warming. The loss of biodiversity, loss of livelihoods for people living in poverty who depend upon them. Much waste in the process of forest clearing. Thus, rainforest preservation and restoration is a global public good because a restorative mechanism for the environment. Sustainable management of rainforests is a priority. Provide funds, debt relief to help enhance biodiversity. In addition, support for forest preservation as climate change mitigation. Now, let's go to the policy options in developing and in developed countries. What developed countries can do for the global environment? So the following are these uh, emissions, emissions controls, including greenhouse gases, research and development on green technology and pollution control. So those, so the uh, transfer of technology to developing countries. Next is the restrictions on unsustainable production. Can environment and development go together? Hmm. So according to the educationist. From Hakkar, Timbul, or Timble, environment and development are not contradictory. They even complement each other. So, how come environment and development are not contradictory while, while development are the cause of the depletion of natural resources? In behalf of the group, we thank you for listening and watching through this video. We have learned so much from our reports 
that would be all again thank you everyone god bless you all and keep safe always bye